our time in these next few weeks is going to be spent in thinking about the church and the purpose of the church, uh, seeking to minister uh, to all of us in terms of what God has called us to and how it is we are to approach difficult seasons in our lives. Now, these are difficult days for the church because they are difficult days in the world. They're difficult days in the culture in which we live. Uh, the challenges are many, and uh, the thinking varies among God's people. And because of that, there is the potential, the threat of disunity. Uh, there is the potential and threat of damage being done to God's people. Uh, there's also the opportunity for each of us to turn our attention to what the Word of God has to say, to take time to evaluate where our thinking is coming from. If there is the potential that our mind has been squeezed into the mold of the world, as Romans 12, 1 and 2 warns against. If there is the potential that this is a time to reveal that we love the world and the things that are in the world, and that the love of the Father is not really what is being manifested through our lives. It's a time of a need of forbearance toward one another, as God is very forbearing toward us, and that He is able in His providential care of His people to minister to individuals, to minister to church leaders, to minister to believers, the fellowship of believers within the church. So we're stepping aside from our character studies to spend a number of weeks in thinking about church life and thinking about our responses uh, to the day in which we live and thinking about the renewal of mind that needs to be taking place in each of our lives. Our approach today is a bit different than norm, uh, a bit different than the normal way in which we would come to a subject like this. It's actually a bit of an overview from three different passages of Scripture. Our beginning place is actually a song a song that came out of a poem that was written back in the 1800s. It was put to music in 1979 and has become a very helpful song for many of us as we give thought to our lives before God, to our life in Christ, to what we might call and what is known as New Testament Christianity. It hones in on a fundamental emphasis, emphasis that every Christian needs to keep before himself or herself. I'd like to begin by sharing its words, and the title of our message comes from the song, Not I, But Christ. Follow along with these words. Not I, but Christ. Be honored, loved, exalted. Not I, but but Christ be seen, be known, and heard. Not I, but Christ in every look and action. Not I, but Christ in every thought and word. Here's the plea, here's the refrain. Oh, to be saved from myself, dear Lord. Oh, to be lost in thee. Oh, that it may be no more I, dear Lord, but Christ that lives in me. This is a communication, a verse that communicates the intent to honor Christ in and through one's life. The intent to honor Christ in and through one's life. It comes in the form of a confession. Its attitude is one of humility. It springs from heart level devotion. It rings of resolution and conviction. It focuses on the supremacy of Christ. Not I but Christ be honored. Not I but Christ be loved. Not I but Christ be exalted. Not I but Christ be seen. 
Not I, but Christ be known. Not I, but Christ be heard. Not I, but Christ in every look and action. Not I, but Christ in every thought and word. The supremacy of Christ. The second verse follows with an emphasis on the sufficiency of Christ. Not I, but Christ to gently soothe in sorrow. Not I, but Christ to wipe the falling tear. Not I, but Christ to lift the heavy burden. Not I, but Christ to hush away all fear. We hear a faith. We hear yieldedness. We hear dependency. We hear of help. We hear words of hope. Oh, to be saved from myself, dear Lord. Oh, to be lost in thee. Oh, that it may be no more I, dear Lord, but Christ that lives in me. This focus upon Christ that answers every need of our souls, the sufficiency of Christ, understanding the sufficiency of Christ answers many of the dilemmas, many of the conflicts, many of the hurts. It answers the despair, the discouragement, uh, the angst, the anxiety, maybe even some of the attack that takes place in difficult times like this. We have the supremacy of Christ. We have the sufficiency of Christ in this poem, this song. The third verse, we have a testimony to the hope that we have in Christ that motivates us living for him. These are words of fulfillment and contentment, oneness. Christ, only Christ, ere long will fill my vision. Glory excelling soon, full soon I'll see. Christ, only Christ, my every wish fulfilling. Christ, only Christ, my all in all to be. Here's an emphasis on satisfaction in Christ. We see the supremacy of Christ in the first verse of this poem. We see the sufficiency of Christ in the second verse. It focuses on Christ as the answer to every need. In the third verse, we see the hope in Christ, the satisfaction in Christ that motivates our living for him. The need that we have is that our souls might be saturated with his person. That is what will move us forward. That is the answer, the primary answer, the fundamental answer, the root answer to challenges such as we find ourselves in. And again, the refrain, oh, to be saved from myself, dear Lord. Oh, to be lost in thee. Oh, that it may be no more I, dear Lord, but Christ that lives in me. So not I, but Christ is a wonderful testimony in poem and in song of what the scriptures teach. It's a description of, it's a communication of New Testament Christianity. So if you are a believer listening to this message, if you are one who is trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, that's a past work, the point in time which you came to Christ. That's a present work. There's a saving work that continues in your life, and it is centered in Christ. And that is a future work. That is a salvation of hope that this poem and the scripture speak of, the hope in Christ that motivates us to live for him. New Testament Christianity, again, can be summed up in three phrases. The first is the supremacy of Christ, the intent to honor him in and through our lives. Secondly, the sufficiency of Christ, a focus on Christ that answers every need of my soul. And then the satisfaction of Christ. That's the hope in Christ that motivates our living for him. This is the foundation of our hope as Christians. This is at the root of our integrity as Christians. 
and it is the end of our lives as Christians. This poem, turned into a spiritual song, is an expression of the heart of Paul. It really is New Testament Christianity. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's man's greatest need. That's man's great joy. That's man's great hope. Man's great need, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Man's great joy, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Man's great hope, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This saving work, this sanctifying work, this work of new birth, and this new life that has been granted to us in the person of Jesus Christ. I would like to think in a summary way, if we might, in this sermon. The three verses of this song can be paralleled with three chapters from the New Testament that introduce three letters that Paul wrote to the church. And we're going to move rather rapidly through this because the intention is simply to bathe our souls in the truth of the Scripture, to reflect briefly on each introductory chapter and to allow those truths to wash over us. I'd like to begin in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I'd like to begin by reading the first 14 verses of this chapter. And again, in an overview fashion, just trying to get these things in front of us and allow us to begin to think about these things together, possibly to follow up with each of these in the coming weeks. Ephesians chapter 1, we read Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purchased or purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, and whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. As Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, he encourages the believers. He speaks of the supremacy of Christ. 
He extols the blessings of being in Christ. Every possible spiritual blessing is ours in Christ. This is the new life that has been given to those that believe. So he praises God for these spiritual blessings, these blessings of the Holy Spirit that come to us through Christ. He praises God because this is that new life that has been given to the believer. And this is as well the uniting element in the life of the church, in the life of the church of Christ, Christ church. Every possible spiritual blessing is ours in Christ. He makes it clear that this is rooted in eternity, in the heart of God. He says here in this song of praise that this is the Father's redemptive design. It reflects the glory of who he is in himself, that underneath all of this, behind these spiritual blessings is the redemptive design that reflects the glory of the God that we worship. It comes from God himself. It's rooted in eternity in the heart of God. It's his eternal counsel, knowing fully the guilt and shame of humanity, knowing that man would, in Adam and Eve, say no to him knowing about the fall, knowing about the rebellion in his eternal counsel. He provided that every possible spiritual blessing could be ours in Christ. Paul glories in his merciful provision at ultimate cost to himself, speaks of the redemption that comes through the humiliation of Jesus Christ. In this song, which in itself has three verses, each ending with to the praise of his glory, he magnifies the Father, he magnifies the Son, and he magnifies the Holy Spirit, through whom, all in one, these spiritual blessings come to us, restoring us, regenerating us, redeeming us, remaking us, the supremacy of Christ. Every possible spiritual blessing is ours in Christ. It's rooted in eternity in the heart of God. It's settled forever according to the will of God. It's making provision for salvation. There is no other possible salvation. There is a singular way of justification. It is in Christ. It is in him. It is through his atoning work. This redemptive plan is foreshadowed throughout the Old Testament. This provision that God has made to bring men to holiness is foreshadowed in all of the sacrifices and ceremonies that we read about in the book of Leviticus that magnify the holiness of our God and foreshadow the fact that God would do everything necessary to make us holy. It's grace motivated. It's grace granted. It's grace energized. It's all of him and none of us. Our responsibility, our response is one of faith. Our response is one of receiving the supremacy of Christ, Ephesians 1, every possible spiritual blessing is ours in Christ. Paul says it's rooted in eternity in the heart of God and it's settled forever according to the will of God. He also, in his testimony in introducing this letter, tells us that this magnifies Christ as the ultimate expression of God. And so when the songwriter says, not I, but Christ, she's reflecting Paul's message in Ephesians chapter 1. 
Paul's message in the letter to the Ephesians, not I, but Christ be honored, love exalted. Not I, but Christ be seen, be known, be heard. Not I, but Christ in every look and action. Not I, but Christ in every thought and word. What is that? That is a magnification of Christ. That is rejoicing in the supremacy of Christ. The believer's riches are in Christ. All of the blessings that come through the Holy Spirit are in Christ. Everything that's needed for spiritual life, for righteous standing, and for godly character comes to us in Christ. Everything that's needed for spiritual life, righteous standing, and godly character come to us through Christ. We have been rescued by Christ. We are seated with Christ in heaven. And we are to be living out Christ on this earth. That's why in the remainder of the chapter of Ephesians 1, Paul prays in terms of what he has praised God for in these first verses. He says, wherefore, I also, verse 15, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who do believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things, everything under his feet, and gave him or appointed him to be the head over all things to the church. That's us, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The supremacy of Christ, every possible spiritual blessing is ours in Christ. Turn now, if you would, to the book of Colossians, another of these letters, these epistles written to the church, a hundred miles inland from Ephesus. It's what we might call a church plant. Seems to have grown out of the church at Ephesus. And a few years into their church life, some say about five years into their church life, there was the influx of challenges to Christ alone. There was the influx of the astrology of those ancient days, of Eastern mysticism, of Jewish legalism, of pretentious Gnosticism, those that would say there is a higher knowledge of God, and this is the formula. This is what you must do to have that higher knowledge of God. All of that within about five years of the birth of that church, Colossae. And we're going to see that Colossians 1 parallels, is paralleled by the second verse of the song that we've shared with you, not I but Christ. We have, first of all, the supremacy of Christ in Ephesians 1. We have, secondly, the sufficiency of Christ in Colossians 1. What is Paul's answer to the influx of those ideas, of those philosophies of of those religious concepts that actually were making their way into the church, but were depreciating Christ alone. Well, Colossians chapter 1 introduces what he has to say to us in this letter. Colossians 1 verse 1, Paul, again, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints, and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, that's the church at Colossae, grace be unto you in peace 
from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3 of Colossians 1, we give thanks. There's sincere gratitude from Paul. We, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. He says, we're continually praying for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints and because of for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. He's making clear to them, this is how this came to you, faith and love and hope. It's the truth of the gospel. It's the truth of Christ. Verse six, he says, which is coming to you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, which is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of unto all pleasing, walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, translated us, transferred us into the kingdom of his dear Son. The sufficiency of Christ, Colossians 1, the fullness of his person, transforms who we are. The fullness of his person transforms who we are. It's not Christ plus something. It's the fullness of his person. Who is he? Look at verse 14. He says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, or we might say over all of creation. Speaking of Christ, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, for in him in all things, for in all things he might have the preeminence, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. The fullness of his person transforms who we are. This is the sufficiency of Christ. It produces fruit in the life of every true believer. Simple faith, love, and hope is where Paul begins, but then he talks in verse number 10 about a worthy walk. The gospel itself communicates that it will do a transforming work in the life of every believer so that that life will produce fruit. That life will be holy to the Lord. That life will be marked by a worthy walk. This is not a primary emphasis many times in the church of our day. Holiness of life, separation to the Lord, living as the bride of Christ, being caught up in this transforming work that conforms us more and more to the image of Christ. But this is what happens when Christ comes in 
and has his way in our lives. The sufficiency of Christ, the fullness of his person, it transforms who we are. It produces fruit in the life of every believer. It provides strength for grace living as he is trusted. There's no additions to Christ. There's no additions needed to Christ. The need is for us to embrace Christ fully. Coming into the church at Colossae were these deeper life formulas, we might say. Deep, deeper life formulas discount Christ. It adds to Christ. There were diets and disciplines that were put before the Colossian believers, but that minimizes Christ. There were Gnostic ideas that you could have a fuller knowledge, a deeper knowledge, a higher knowledge. Well, that added to Christ. There were various philosophies that distorted Christ. And Paul is arguing that everything that we need is in Christ and that Christ provides strength for grace living as we trust him. Follow along in verse number 20 of Colossians 1. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. Notice the end of verse 22, present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and not and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to the saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is that? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. A ministry that has been enabled by God's grace, Paul is speaking about here. The fullness of his person transforms who we are. It produces fruit in the life of every true believer. It provides strength for grace living as he is trusted. And it displays the riches of his glory, filled with hope. Paul's approach is to declare the preeminence of Christ. He is all in all. 30 times he uses the word all in these verses. Fullness, perfection, completion is, are the words of those who are adding to the gospel. And Paul says he is all in all. He combats the false notions of there's more to be added to Christ. He says what's needed is the application of Christ to daily life. That's what happens in chapters three and four of this book when he moves to application. The application of the life of Christ to daily living is was needed to glorify him by living purely and enjoying the fellowship of the saints and loving one another in the home and living out Christ at work and sharing Christ with others. You realize this is what God has for us in our day. God's answer to the difficulty. God's answer to the challenges, the sufficiency of Christ. God's answer to this idea of religious tolerance and many different religious ideas. God's answer to that is Christ and Christ alone. Not I, but Christ to gently soothe in sorrow. Not I, but Christ to wipe the falling tear. Not I, but Christ to lift the heavy burden. Not I, but Christ to hush away all fear. The sufficiency of Christ. The next 
challenge, the next blessing, the next revelation is the satisfaction that is in Christ. And for this, we turn back to Philippians chapter 1. We have the supremacy of Christ, Ephesians 1. We have the sufficiency of Christ, Colossians 1. Now we have the satisfaction of Christ. And that is found in Philippians chapter number 1. Rejoice in the Lord is the emphasis. Fellowship in Christ. 18 times in the first chapter of Philippians. This idea of singleness of mind the joy of the Spirit, the fellowship with God's people, triumphing in hardship. Paul speaks to that in this book. Follow along, chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He first of all says, I have you on my mind. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Notice verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I have you in my mind. Then he says, I have you in my heart. Verse 7 and 8, even as it is meet for me to think this of you, because I have you in my heart. Inasmuch as both in my bonds and in, my, in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are our partakers. Your partakers are partners of my grace. I have you in my mind, 3 through 6. I have you in my heart, 7 and 8. He says, I have you in my prayers. After he says, verse 8, for God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. I have you in my heart. I have you in my prayers. Verse 9, this I pray. Notice how he prays. Make application, please, to our day that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. That's discernment that you might approve things that are excellent, decide what is best, that you might be sincere and without offense or blameless till the day of Christ, being filled, much like he says in Colossians, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto glory and praise, the glory and praise of God. Is this true of us? Is the fruit of righteousness what people see when they see us? See, the satisfaction of Christ, Paul emphasizes that the work begun in us will continue until it's complete. And thus, he's calling us to rejoice in the Lord. The process satisfies as it shapes us into Christ's likeness. We can rejoice because we know what's happening. We know what God's doing. So it is satisfying to us as it strengthens the individual, as it matures the individual, as it strengthens the fellowship of believers. And Paul is able to say, this is satisfying. Notice how he says it, verse 12. But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather into the furtherance of the gospel so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident in my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Verse 15, it says, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely. They had issues with Paul, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. But, the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Okay, what's the conclusion of that? He's basically saying, what does it matter? What then, verse 18, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and I will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He's going to help. He's helping me according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. You hear the satisfaction coming out of this apostle? 
Verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I what not. He's hard pressed in both directions. Verse 23 says, for I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, he's persuaded of this, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for the furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. The process satisfies as it shapes us in Christ's likeness. Secondly, the hardships satisfy as they refine and temper us. That's a mindset that's contrary to the normal thinking, but it's scriptural through and through. The hardship is part of the process. It's necessary, and we should face it with anticipation and readiness and expectancy. The hardship, the hardship satisfy as they refine. Let's finish with what he says in the final four verses of this introductory chapter only, verse 27 only. Let your conversation be as become the gospel of Christ. Have you noticed in all three of these books, it's calling God's people to holiness? Is that a call that we're hearing? Is holiness what we're seeing? Paul says, let your conversation, let your manner of life be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind. Look at this, striving together, standing firm, striving together for the faith of the gospel, working side by side for the faith of the gospel, not divided, not splintered, not on the attack. Verse 28, and nothing terrified by your adversaries which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. You're not supposed to live frightened by your opponents. For unto you, verse 29 says, it is given in behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. The satisfaction of Christ, the work begun in us, will continue until complete. That's where we are. The process satisfies as it shapes us in Christ's likeness. The hardships satisfy as they refine and temper us. And to use a word that's in our vernacular of our day, this journey, it's a good word, even if it's overused. This journey we're on is satisfying as it serves to magnify Christ. A behavior that becometh the gospel this journey is satisfying as it serves to magnify Christ. Listen to the hymn writer. Christ, only Christ, ere long will fill my vision. Glory excelling soon, full soon I'll see. Christ, only Christ, and every wish fulfilling. Christ, only Christ, my all in all to be. Oh, to be saved from myself, dear Lord. Oh, to be lost in thee. Oh, that it may be no more I, dear Lord, but Christ that lives in me. Father, we thank you. We praise you that you are readily available to us, that you are actively ministering to us. As Father, we can bow before you and recognize what you have done for us in Christ. We can praise you for the supremacy of Christ. We can praise you for the sufficiency of Christ. We can praise you for satisfaction in Christ. We can praise you that you've put together your people, intending for us to stand together, to be of the same mind, and unless our mind is the mind of Christ, we will never be of the same mind. Unless we're satisfied in Christ, we're going to be dissatisfied. We're going to be divided. I pray, Father, that you'd have your way in your church around this world. 
I pray that you'd have your way in our little fellowship of believers. And Father, we'd be honest with these texts and that we would allow you to alter the way we're thinking, transform the way we're living, that you might be honored, that our life might be about Christ. And we might be able to say, oh, to be saved from myself, dear Lord, to be lost in thee, that it may not be any more us, dear Lord, but Christ seen, living, on display in us. We praise you for these things in Christ's name. Amen.